Thanks be to God. Eve saw the tree, and her eye desired the fruit, and she desired it so that it, she could be wise. Those two words for desire there, those two words sort of come together and describe what is happening, how she, she wants something. Is she hungry? Nope, she has enough. Does she need more wisdom? Does she need to be closer to God? Does she need more food? Nope, it's, it's a disordered desire is what it is. She desires something that she should not, and she and Adam take a bite, and uh, they do this together. There's one other place for those, where those two words for desire happen, uh, one other place in Scripture, and they're very specific words, and so uh, to find those two words together is not a mistake. There, there's an intentionality there. There's a connection. The other place that we see desire named as a problem with those words is in the Tenth Commandment. Deuteronomy 5, 21, Neither shall you desire or covet your neighbor's wife. Neither shall you desire or covet your neighbor's house, field, servants, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. All right, so this is the last of the Ten Commandments. And uh, as we see with translation, uh, sometimes things get interesting. I stand by my contention, oft repeated, that tra Bible translators are weenies because you hear the word covet. And covet, you know, who, who has said the word covet this week? Right? We don't use that word, do we? It's sort of a passing word. It's an old word. It doesn't have a lot of punch to it. It, it, it doesn't get at the sense of a disordered desire. I mean, there are other words we, we sometimes use. Uh, cravings. You talk about cravings. But that tends to talk... That gets the, the intensity of it. But it tends to be cravings for food. And we don't send... If you have a, a craving or a hankering for something, that doesn't have this sense of disorderedness, right? But the term that maybe best captures the sense of disordered desire would be lust. But the problem with that is that it's a very specific type of desire, right? And this is a broad spectrum desire. This is a, any type of desire. Look at the list that it lays out. This is, not, this is a disordered desire, an unhealthy desire for anything that your neighbor has, not just your neighbor's husband or wife. And so this, and just look, look at how broad this spectrum is too. If, if you think about, like, sort of imagining God putting this commandment down, sort of creating a checklist. Now, don't covet your neighbor's wife or house or field or male servant or female servant or aunt, ox or you know, just just don't anything. Just don't covet anything of your neighbor's. Right? This sort of wraps up with it. Just don't covet. If it's your neighbor's, don't obsess about it. Don't get caught up about it. And the the warning here. We see violated, this obsession, this uh, disordered desire, we see it broken in Scripture. The two most egregious examples is, uh, are uh, the story of King Ahab, the story we, re we heard last week. King Ahab, he has this disordered desire for Naboth's field, Naboth's vineyard. And so he lies and kills to be able to have what he, he wants. It's the same desire, the same sense of disordered desire that we see in King David when he takes Bathsheba which then leads to lying and the death of her husband, right? I don't think it's a mistake that um, the Tenth Commandment in the two versions of, that it is given, Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, uh, the list is, is differs in what is, what's first, right? In, in Exodus it says, don't take your, don't, possess, don't uh, wrongly desire your neighbor's land, yeah, see here that King Ahab, right? And in, and in Deuteronomy, it begins with, don't wrongly uh, desire your neighbor's wife. Did, did he hear that, King David? Right? The, the, the two most egregious examples of desire are, are a wife and a land that we hear taken by a king. And that, I think that ref is reflected in how the commandments are remembered. Jumping ahead to the New Testament, James sums up how disordered desire fractures community. He, he writes, it's in James 4, The conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something, and you don't have it, so you commit murder. You covet something, and you can't obtain it. 
So you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you don't ask. You ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you, want, what you get on your pleasures. You ask and you don't receive because you're asking for something you shouldn't be desiring in the first place. Right? Now this is not to say that desire is wrong. Desire in its essential nature is part of being human. Right? God has desires. We read of them in scripture and we are made in the image of God and so we have desires. God has created the world to be desirable. Every time something is created in Scripture in the, in the first seven days, God looks at it and what does God say? This is good. This is desirable. You should want this because it's great, right? So we are made to desire. The thing is, we have to choose, we have to shape ourselves to desire what is healthy. Right? Uh, 1,600 years ago, St. Augustine wrote that our hearts will not find rest until they rest in God. We won't find satisfaction, we won't find peace and joy until we, we are seeking and desiring what God desires. For if we desire what it, we should not be desiring, if our desires become disordered, we become inhumane. We become less than human. We, we are disordered. Right? We, our desires will lead us astray. And we face a challenge today because we live in a culture that wants to shape our desires, to shape us to want to control, uh, control our world, control others, to shape us to try to, I mean, we are control, shaped to, so that we would desire to see our enemies get theirs. I mean, there are so many desires we are attempted to be shaped in. But I think the desire that I want to look at today can be summarized in one word. We are shaped to desire more. Right? We are shaped to desire more. It's not a new thing. Uh, I, the prophet Isaiah laments that those who have a house want another. Those who have fields want to join another field to it. I mean, that's sort of always wanting to keep up with the Jones, always wanting to have more. It's an old problem. There's a new name for it. Have you ever heard of the term affluenza? Right? That came up a few years ago. I'd prefer a simpler name for it, greed. But there's this sense that if we just had more, we would be satisfied. A few years ago, I heard a survey of people who asked, how much more do you need to be satisfied? And so people were asked if they were making $20,000 a year, how much more did they want to be satisfied? About 20%, they wanted 24 grand. They figured if they had 20% more, they'd be happy. And people who were making 60 grand a year, they were asked the same question, how much more do you need to be satisfied? 20%. If I just had $72,000 a year, I'd be happy. And you ask someone who has, makes $150,000 a year, you know, how much more do you need to be satisfied? 20%. You know, if, if I was just pulling down 180 grand a year, I think I'd be okay, right? There's a sense we always want more. It's, and it's the same ratio, right? We always want about 20% more because we can't imagine making twice as much. But 20%, yeah, that, that'd make me happy. We don't have a sense of enough. Right? We always have these new desires. We're shaped to have these new desires. Who here has ever shopped at a Woolsworth? All right, some of you. I know they existed, I admit, that shows my age. But Woolsworth made a great innovation in the formation of desires. You know what that innovation was? Right. Before Woolsworth, if you wanted something, you'd go to a counter, you'd get the clerk, and you'd say to the clerk, Clerk, I would like a blue dress shirt large, tall, right? could you go get that for me? And they'd go back and get it to you. Walls, Woolsworth are the people who inv invented browsing. Right? They put all of the stock out on the floor so you could touch it all. And we've done the studies, as soon as you touch something, you're more likely to buy it. How often are you walking through the store and, and you see something, and you never even thought you needed it before, but you see something and you go, ooh, yeah. And then you touch it, and then you buy it. Right? How often does that happen? Right? If we, we will invent desires for, the, for things we have never even knew existed five minutes ago. And, and if you want to know how powerful it is, the, how, how our desires can be formed, who here is like Cheetos? Who here enjoys Cheetos? Serious question. Right, Cheetos? What do I have here? What does it look like? A, this bag of packing peanuts, right? This is what Olivia's Mary Kay comes in. Bag of packing peanuts. You know what packing peanuts are made out of? Corn derivative. You know what Cheetos are made out of? Corn derivative. Same thing. You know how Cheetos kind of melt on your tongue? Yep. Melting on my tongue. 
We as a culture have been trained to want corn derivative with a little bit of cheese powder over an apple. I hope you never eat a Cheeto again. <laughs> you know what they call Cheetos? Bioplastic. Right? Because you take a biological material, corn, and you make it, you, make, you treat it like a plastic, and then you either pack Mary Kay in it, or you uh, put cheese on it. And there you go. You know, another th way that we, our, our desires have been shaped. How many clothes did your great-grandparents have in their closet? Think about that. How many clothes do you have in your closet? Do you need that many? Why do you have them? You desire them, right? You, you, do, you want them. Right? You just dis disordered, you walk through the store and you touch it and you say, ooh, they look good, good with my blue shirt. And you buy it, right? We have been formed to desire cornstarch instead of apples. We have been desired to desire, we have been formed to desire clothing that we don't need and don't really, we're not going to wear, right? The sad reality of such disordered, disordered desire of always wanting more is that it never satisfies. Greed, if you always, are always getting more stuff, there's always something faster or newer or shinier or smaller or quicker, right, that someone else has. And if, you're, if we get wrapped up in greed, there will always be something else to get. If we get wrapped up in envy, which is the desire of what other people have, there's always someone who has something better. The irony I'm, I'm seeing now, I was reading about how some people live in New York, that uh, envy, we, te we tend to be envious of those who have more or, or better or faster. What I'm reading about is those who can afford more, better, and faster are now becoming envious of those who have less because they envy the simplicity because when you have more stuff, you know what you have to do? Keep track of it, maintain it, all right? So greed and envy, they're ultimately, they're ultimately destructive. They ultimately cause more disorder, more challenges. They are less satisfying. We are not satisfied because we are formed to desire what others have. And, and you know, Adam and Eve caused enough problem. they didn't, problems. They didn't have neighbors to covet their stuff. Right? We have plenty of neighbors. Now we have to protect all our stuff from other people. And it's just, it just it messes up our, our lives. It's not satisfying. It gets in the way of our relationship with others. Right? The, the flip, remember there's a flip of every commandment. Don't kill, the flip of that is take care of your neighbor. Don't lie, the flip of that is tell the truth. Don't covet, don't, de don't desire in a disordered fashion, the flip of that is desire what truly is satisfying. Right? What does satisfy? What does God desire and what are we made to desire? We are made to desire what is beautiful. Music, art, things that are uh, uh, of, of nature, right? Go out and garden. Or hunt, right? Go out and enjoy the world, till, the wor till and keep the earth. Service to community, build or teach or repair for the good of others. By naming how our desires can be disordered, we can then say what should we, what should we focus on, what should we desire, and then we can cultivate that. Cultivate a community that lifts up forgiveness, that practices beauty and is sent out to serve. We are here to cultivate desires that, that are healthy desires. Right? And we need the help of our church to do that because you're not going to find it anywhere else. You are not going to go home and turn on the TV and find a commercial that says, you have everything you could ever want. Just sit back for a minute and enjoy all the stuff you have. Right? You're not going to have that commercial. You're not going to turn on the TV and have a commercial that says to you, turn this off. Go outside and take a breath of fresh air and appreciate the day that God has made. No, no, well, what are you going to find? You're going to have find commercials to get more and more stuff. We need our church to be able to be able to name our concerns, our worries about the ways that our lives might be out of line and be able to figure out what God does desire and what we might desire as well. I do have a, a few practical suggestions about how we might try to focus our desires in a healthier way. Because we are approaching the season of advertising. I mean Christmas, right? So ha has the mail started? How many catalogs do you get a day right now? Right? Can you take the time to write and cancel them? Because the Lord knows you don't need to kill that many trees. And every time you get a catalog, what do you do? You take it up and you start flipping through it? It's like browsing. You touch it. You buy it. For me, it's emails. I get emails about sales all the time. I bought a pen online. 
And I get like three or four emails a day of people trying to sell me pens. You know, I, I have a pen in my pocket. You know what it does? It writes. It's good. I'm fine, right? I don't need more. But I open the email and I look at it and I go, ooh. Right? You know, at the bottom of all those emails, there's a little button that says unsubscribe. Start clicking on that. Seriously, just start clicking on that. It will save us from ourselves, from our own disordered desires. And instead, we might start to focus on what might be truly satisfying during this time. Go out and buy lunch with a few folks. And maybe this is a time to discuss with the parents of small children, whether they be our own small children or the parents of our grandchildren, about the formation of children's desires. Because our children will be formed by our culture to be greedy, self-centered, little materialistic bundles of joy, right? Unless we teach them otherwise. Form them otherwise. What's the saying? Get them something to wear, something they need, something to uh, need, wear, play. There's a fourth one. But just set up a set, set up, you know, we're going to get, the, this is how we're going to handle Christmas. We're going to do this because we don't need to desire this much stuff. Stuff, right? We, if we don't form the desires of children, someone else will form them for us. And, and those are just some ideas I have. If you have other ideas, please feel free to share them because Lord knows we all struggle with this. The promise of the Ten Commandments, and of this commandment in particular, is that when we follow them, we find what is more satisfying. Right? We are, we're able to start naming the Cheetos and picking apples. Right? We can start naming the things that's just fluff and nothing, the things that are ultimately not satisfying, and be able to say, no, this is good and beautiful and true, and this is what I will seek, this is what I will desire. The promise that we see in the Ten Commandments is if we are formed by these commandments, we will be living in a community that reflects God's guidance on how to live, how we are built to live. And instead of bouncing from desire to desire, always wanting more and never feeling satisfied, we will be satisfied, for we will be in God. God's will in living as God's people. Thanks be to God. Amen. And if anyone wants some Cheetos, I'll pass them around during that. <laughs>